Up to this point, Brian has been trying to survive and learning new skills along the way. He first is worried about getting out of the elements and finding shelter. It doesn't take him long to find a half-formed cave with a roof above his head. This is reinforced with wood doors and walls to keep out animals and the weather. He goes in search of food and finds two types of berries. The first is the gut cherries that fills him up but makes him sick, and the second is the more flavorful raspberries. With a little work, he is able to create a spear to catch fish. It wasn't easy for him to use that tool, and eventually he uses school information about refraction of light in order to spear the fish. This gives him at least three sources of food with fish and two types of berries. Eventually, he learns enough that life in the forest becomes relatively easy. The hatchet that his mother gave him made this all possible. There is a rising action in the story as he learns more ways to survive. For Brian, the greatest achievement is his ability to kill and cook a bird. For some reason, he doesn't think of the fish as a proper meat diet component. Along with the increase in his first survival skills, he still thinks about life at home. The thought of what he witnessed his mother do eventually informs his mental preoccupation. He doesn't do anything to help himself overcome the thoughts of his mother or to be rescued. These remain unchanged. The climax of the book Hatchet by Gary Polson will alter the boy's newfound goals. He is going to have to make difficult decisions. Hello and welcome to NBM English. My name is Nate and these are my notes. Passage of time in the forest was not counted by days or hours. There's no evidence that Brian tried to keep a tally of the days after the first week. Even the first couple of days when he had climbed out of the lake, he was not sure how long the time had passed. He questioned if it was day one or day two when he sat at the bottom of the tree. What Brian seems to remember is when certain events took place. He mentions specifically the first day of meat when he kills the birds. This is followed by the mention of the first day he killed a rabbit for its meat. For some reason, he doesn't consider fish his meat. Of course, there are first events that are not mentioned, but they are implied. The narration of the book is not going to get into those details and retell the whole story. Readers can make their own lists of firsts. This might include the first berries, the first shelter, and the first fire. It might be tempting to assume that this is the climax of the story. He has finally started living a relatively normal life in the forest. His survival skills are great enough that he didn't have to worry about hunger and shelter. Obviously, the forest is still dangerous, because he mentions that a physical injury could cost him his life, that normally would not back home. He has come to accept the animals as they have accepted him. They are still dangerous, but he doesn't express that he's worried about them. He is now a part of nature as they are. At least that's what it seems to his thought process. This is demonstrated in the scene with the wolves passing by him without attacking. He has food, shelter, and even a bit of happiness. Brian's newfound instincts about the forest would warn him about danger, but not before two near tragic events set him back with complications. A moose attacks him, and before he can recover, a fierce tornado hits. Two assumptions he thought about his time in the forest were immediately challenged. The moose attack puts into question his relationship to nature. Before the attack, he saw the bear and pack of wolves without any incident. A sense of respect existed, even if it was only in his mind. It made him feel a part of nature around him. Sure, he understood the dangers of wild animals and sought to protect himself against them, but at least he understood that they would act on the logic of basic instincts. He was developing his own instincts as a rule of survival. Recognizing details and a heightened sense of his surroundings was growing. Problems could quickly be detected and dealt with. The moose attack took that assurance away. There was no logic to the attack that he could detect. Worse was that the moose sent him into the water and mud, coming close to killing him, twice. Brian felt he was minding his own business, cleaning a bird for later dinner. The attack reminded him that no matter how connected he now felt to nature, there was a lot he didn't and couldn't understand. Later that same day, a tornado hit and completely tore his forest life apart. It destroyed everything he had built for survival. By the end of the wind-swept terror, there was no more shelter, no more food storage, no more tools for hunting. Physically, he was no worse than after the moose attack, but it was a mental blow. After all his work, it was back to the first day. He realized once more that he was alone with no help or way he knew of to be rescued. His newfound comfortable forest life 
was taken away from him in one day. Both the moose and the tornado was associated with a sense of mystery. The mystery worked two different ways. For the moose, it was about the mysteries of nature and how things in the forest worked. Watching an animal eat his eggs that he was eating from another animal, Brian learned the first rule of survival was food. He decided that eating was the number one priority of animals. He most likely used that thought to interpret how animals reacted and sought not to be in the food chain. With the moose attack, this neat little philosophy of the forest he developed evaporated. He looked around and saw no reason for the attacks. He was not in the way of the moose and food. There is no baby moose to protect. There is only a big and mean moose taking pleasure in trying to drown him in the lake. It was very much disturbing to Brian because it brought a mystery to nature that he thought he already understood. Animals wanted to eat and protect themselves from those who wanted to eat them. So long as he understood that and sought shelter and defenses, he could live among the bears and wolves. The moose's behavior was outside that simple calculation. He was lucky to come out of the encounter alive. The tornado was a different mystery as part of the narrative. At first, Brian heard a sound that was hard to detect. As it grew louder, he couldn't quite place where it was in a recognizable category. It felt alive and coming specifically for Brian in his shelter. Once he realized that it was a tornado, it was too late to do anything about it. Not that he could have done anything anyway because of its tremendous power. The buildup to the tornado hitting his shelter contains wonder and fear over whether the noise could be coming his way. This mystery of not knowing the reason for the sound builds up tension. The reader and Brian are both trying to put the clues together. Explaining the sound and guessing its purpose, as if it was a living organism, also known as personification, gives it an extra feeling of danger. Labeling it as a tornado at the very first would have minimized the emotional impact. Everyone knows what a tornado is and what it can do. Waiting until the last moment to reveal what the loud noise is adds more fear to the final destruction. The mystery around the approaching tornado adds suspense, while the moose attack is a reminder of how fragile Brian's life is if he is not rescued. Despite what seems like physical and mental devastation, Brian is far from the first day of the crash. He's gained a lot of experience through the days and weeks. There may not be any more shelter to climb back into, or fish pond to gather food, or tools to hunt birds. He still has two resources to help him recover. He has the hatchet from his mother that he used from the start. He has himself and all that he's learned over time about building a shelter, fire, and hunting and gathering. The devastation might have, for the moment, caused him great mental agony, but he would get over it soon enough. Another tool he gained was self-confidence that he can overcome obstacles. Self-pity can't make fire or put food in the stomach. He had come to that conclusion very early when he first got stranded in the forest. Now he didn't need the same amount of time to feel bad for himself. There was an inner strength that had him go right back to work, picking up the pieces, literally from the ground. He gathered what parts of the old shelter he could and rebuilt them. New tools were fashioned with the help of the hatchet. The tornado made things wet, but Brian was still able to find enough wood to start a fire. Very soon, things were nearly back to normal, at least for his life alone in the forest. Seeing the tail of the downed airplane sticking out of the water after the tornado is the start of the climax of the story. The tornado has destroyed what he was able to build from the forest, but it brought part of the plane to the surface of the lake. Brian almost immediately decides that he needed to get out onto the lake and into the plane. He wanted a survival kit that was left behind when he escaped after the first crashing. He wasn't sure what was inside the pack, but it would at least have food. Besides, there are probably other things that could be useful, although he didn't know what they might be. For the moment, any plans to get the plane and recover the survival pack was a theory. It could still turn out to be a failed mission. Not taking any chances, he rebuilt what he could and gathered fish to eat and give him some strength. Brian was not impulsive like at the start when eating too many gut berries that made him sick. His motto for trying to reach the plane was food, thought, and action in that order. He still needed a way to get out onto the lake. Swimming there would be useless and he would end up drowning. All these dilemmas of rebuilding, eating fish to remain strong, and what he needed to do to reach the plane tail is the high point of the story. Throughout, there has been ups and downs with slow buildup to a relatively normal life. There is the first food, the first shelter, the first fire, the first fish, the first bird, and acceptance that he was going to be alone for a long time. The moose, the tornado, and now the airplane tail changed all that. He didn't exactly have a way home, but he did have a strong connection to the outside world. 
The survival pack might give him more resources to work with. At the least, it would add more time for a greater chance of rescue. Brian could forget the whole thing and keep going the way he had that worked, or try something difficult and probably improve his current life. Making such decisions and doing something about it prepares for the story climax. The critical part of the climax is when Brian loses his hatchet trying to get into the airplane. It was the only tool he had from the outside world, other than his clothes, that kept him alive. He might have even died of starvation without having the trusty gift that his mother gave him. Two risks existed that added suspense to the final story outcome. Going into the water to get the hatchet took critical strength away from Brian that he would need to return to land. If he didn't find the hatchet when diving into the water, his body could give out and end up drowning. Without the hatchet, he could not get into the plane. Without the hatchet, he could not build a fire or chop wood to make tools. He needed it above anything. Recovering the hatchet from the water was a risk he had to take. It might have been an easy decision after weighing the risk of a quick drowning or slow starvation, but the consequences were no less serious. After some struggle, he got the hatchet, got into the plane, and retrieved the survival pack. The book proclaims he had done it and the climax was reached. Getting back to the land with the survival pack was not the end of the story. All the suspense and struggles can now be considered over, but what goes up must come down. Opening the pack is part of the falling action where the story comes to a resolution. For Brian, it is connected to his life before in civilization. He wasn't rescued yet, but he had improvements in food and technology even for a limited time. No longer did he have to rely only on his own tools built with a single hatchet. There is a selection of pre-made food and other sources of heat and fire, and even a folding gun for hunting. No longer was he just a boy of the forest who had to rely on his wits, but a human with advantages. It was a feeling of power that he wasn't completely comfortable with after so long. He was losing his sense of nature built up over the weeks. Part of the story resolution is that Brian returns to life that he once knew, even if that was limited by what the pack contained. The story plot doesn't end with Brian opening the pack, but an actual rescue by an airplane landing in the lake. It wraps up the story and gets Brian out of the forest as he had hoped. But is it a good ending and justified? There's no struggle that ended with the rescue, but it just happened almost by chance, or once again, luck. Perhaps one of the themes of the story is how much luck decides what happens in life, both good and bad. The rescue plane getting a signal that Brian accidentally sets off, then seeing the half-submerged airplane, and finally landing to find the boy eating, is close to literary Deus Ex Machina. This comes from the Greek plays when a god would come down from the sky and help a mortal resolve a problem. It is considered in modern storytelling a false ending or a cheat. The protagonist doesn't need to do anything to get themselves out of trouble. With all that Brian went through and learned, maybe doing something to bring about his own rescue wasn't needed. He wished to be rescued, but at no time was it a main goal of his through his actions. All he wanted was survival to give others time to find him. And that was what was achieved. Question for consideration. Can the ending of a story make or break the enjoyment of what came before? And how or why? Click the subscribe button and notification bell to not miss the next installments and analysis.